All right, now I don't have any text tonight. Just turn anywhere, it's all good. <laughs> and uh, But I'm going to draw you a picture tonight on uh, where did the did go. Well, this little chart here you'll work with, I haven't had time to fill the thing, all the thing out, never is enough time. But this shows what uh, uh, you're dealing with. What you're dealing with is people. Uh, Job says, man uh, dies and wastes away, and where is he? Well, he's somewhere. Uh, do you know where he is? Do you realize that you profess the only religion in the world that gives personal assurance about life after death? Did you ever hear Pope come over here and tell you when he got saved? But he had access to 200 million people through television and radio and never opened his mouth. Did he know where he was going when he died? Evidently not. Do you know where you're going when you die? Every saved person in that Bible knows where they're going when they die. Paul said, I know him, I believe, I'm persuaded he's able to keep which I've committed me against that day. Simon Peter says, I've got a residence up there, there's a reserve for me up there in heaven. Uh, Christ said, I'll give to my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. Amen. It's that ignorance of that Bible that causes trouble. We have a joke about that, about a brother over in Mobile. Was going to, this probably didn't happen, but the reported old Mobile wanted to be ordained for the ministry, and the brethren got him together and talked, and they said, Brother Jones, as you lead the Bible, he's I believe the Bible from cover to cover. <laughs> And they said, well, could you tell us your fairest uh, story, your favorite story is in the Bible? He said, of course, I wouldn't mind telling you. There was a certain man who had two sons, and the younger of them said, I want to go down to Jericho. And so he went to Jericho, but he fell among the leaves. <laughs> and he, he, they smothered him, but God sent a great big wind down there and blew them away and sent down a lot of rain, and it rained 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> And they went in the cave where the ravens brought him manna in the morning and quail in the afternoon. And he said, when he come out, there was a great river, so great that no man could cross it, so he passed by on the other side. And as he come down to Jericho, he see old Jezebel sitting up in a sycamore tree. <laughs> and, and he said, hey, f throw that old gal down. <laughs> so that, now, you know why some of you aren't laughing. You don't know whether I'm telling the truth or not. <laughs> He said, cast her down. They, they ch chunked her down. He said, chunk her down again. So they chunked her down to 70 times 7. And what remained was baskets full was men, women, and children. And the question I want to ask you gentlemen, the Presbyterian, is this. Whose wife is she going to be in the Day of Judgment? <laughs> now, I've given that churches. And nobody, I've, I've given that churches up north where a guy would say, amen. My God, man. Now, let's just face it, Americans don't read that Bible. They sit around, push buttons, and look at stuff. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you, but suppose I want I tell you ladies to stand. And we went right around here, and I made every one of you give me four verses on how to raise, raise children. Could you give them? I didn't say you weren't a good mother. Don't, don't try to make a fight just because you're stupid. <laughs> I mean, I asked you to give me four verses on how to raise children, Amen. and you can't do it. And this is a good church here. This is a bible even church. Amen. Well, my people, they've been quite exposed to the Bible. Boy, they, they've had everything that is in it about 25 times. But if I, I had you men stand up, give me four, four verses of what the Bible says about sports. You couldn't do it. You don't, well, I believe it, yeah, but what did God say about it? You ain't got an idea in this world. The average Christian handles the Bible just like an unsaved atheist does. You don't know what he said. Now, it's so quiet now you can hear. <laughs> you say, why? Because I'm telling you the truth and you know it. All right, now here, where's what you got? You got Christ dying on the cross for your sins, and you sang about it here tonight and sang good about it, and it was you he's singing about. Now, what are you? He says in First Thessalonians, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully, he that calls you who will do it. You have three parts to you. There's a, a doctor in America that knows that. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. A man is composed of three things. If he's composed of three things, God has to be a trinity because man was made in the image of God. If man was made in the image of God, God has to have a body. Jesus Christ shows up. He has to have a spirit, the Holy Spirit. 
and he has the soul, has to have soul. Nobody sees the soul. Right. Now look here, I come here and I said, I said to you, he who has seen me has seen Pete Ruckman. And then I come back and you ask me about the meeting, I say, no man has seen Pete Ruckman at any time. Christ said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one, right? Yes, sir. Then he said, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, see that stuff? That kind of stuff, what's the trouble? The trouble's right here. What's the soul? You haven't got a medical doctor in America, I tell you. Not even a Christian one. You read all of, of, uh, of the best notes by uh, Brother Schofield, he's a good one. And Chuck Larkin, he's a good one. And Bullinger, he's a good one. They never found it. You know what the Greek said? It said like a ping pong ball or like a bead, or like a marble in your head somewhere, or your left ventricle of your heart, and when you die, it came out of your mouth. <laughs> That's not your soul. You know what that Bible says in one place? It says the rich man was in hell and lifted up his eyes. Why, his physical eyes are up in the grave. What's he doing with eyes down there? Send Lazarus and tip the tip of his finger in water and cool my what? Tongue. He ain't got no tongue down there. Tongues up in the grave. Well, he, well, what is it? See, that's stuff when nobody knows. If you went to any cemetery in this country, yeah. that's as good as a seminary. <laughs> if, you, if you went to any one of them and talked to anybody with an IQ 200, he wouldn't know what he was talking about when he said soul. One of them said it was the attitude for collecting things. It's the feeling you have about the bunk, 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 bunko. <laughs> When you pick up your Bible, you read in Revelation chapter 6, the souls under the altar asked for vengeance and white robes were given them. You've got to have a body wear a robe. What do you got? you got a body you can't see and put a robe over it. Amen. Casper the friendly ghost. <laughs> now here's the greatest Christian that ever lived. He's called up to heaven. When he gets up there, he's caught up the third heaven and I heard words which you speak for a man to utter. And he said, uh, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. Come on, Rab, Rabbi, Rabak, he's a, the highest rabbi you can get, a Rabak, and su studied under the best one they ever had, and he got up to heaven and said, I don't know whether I'm in my, my body or not. Is that a kind of dumb thing to say? In the body or out of the body, I can't tell. Why can't you tell? That's what folks do in Buddhism. They try to get out of the frame. That's what you do with drugs. You try to get out of the frame because all the trouble comes from the frame. And even the best Christian ever lived had trouble with that thing. He's up there looking around. God took him up. His body was lying down there and they thought he was dead. And his body was lying down there and the Lord took him up to the, to the third heaven. That's second uh, uh, Corinthians, the last chapter. And when he was caught up there, he looked around and saw that place. He must have seen Stephen. When Stephen died, he said, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. So he must have seen him. Hi, Steve. Wouldn't that be something? And he got up there. Boy, what a wonderful place. Man, oh man, this is some place. And clapped his hands and oops, no hands. Oops. I'm standing here. What am I standing? I don't see any feet. He said, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. My, what a profession. What is that? What is that? They have no idea. Here's shakes around town trying to tell you how to cure man. Here's the United Nations, how to lead man. They don't even know what a man is. A man is body, soul, and spirit. Now what's going on here? See this basketball? You see that body around there, that leather? Inside that leather, there's another thing like an inner tube inside, but you can't see it. And when you put air in there, you've got three basketballs. No, you've got one. It's in three manifestations. You've got an outside, you've got an inside. Once you put air in there, you get another basketball. That's called a trinity. What's a trinity? The simplest thing in the world. And that's why, you know, Muhammad didn't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. He said God didn't have it a son. He was not a trinity. He said, you Christians worship three gods. See, so your idolaters get you killed. That's because oh, oh, Muhammad didn't have the sense God gave a brass monkey. Set a bucket of water. I'm making a bu bu bucket of water here. Set a bucket of water. That's a, that's a liquid. I can take that thing and freeze it, and it's a solid. I can take that thing and put a fire under it, and it's a vapor. 
And it's the same bucket. It isn't three buckets of different water. The same water is three parts. It's a vapor, and it's also a solid, and it's a liquid. Why, a Trinity is one of the most simple things in the world. No wonder Muhammad couldn't get it. He was dumb as a bunch of rocks. <laughs> you see that thing right there, that sun shining? That thing has heat rays. You can feel them, but you can't see them. It has light rays. You can see them, but you can't feel them. It has actinic rays, and the actinic rays tactinic rays, or you can't see them and you can't feel them. Every day the sun illustrates the Trinity. Yes. When it goes up, when it goes to bed at night, or some done up saying you worship three gods. We, we worship one God and three persons. Yes. Christ said, he has seen me has seen the Father. No man has seen God at any time. What's he saying? You've seen God's body. He says, I and the Father are one. God manifests in the flesh. God's body is Jesus Christ. What's his spirit, the Holy Spirit? What's that soul? Well, whatever that soul, it must look awful, look awful lot like Christ. I mean, that one looks an awful lot like that the basketball there. The soul is a bodily shape inside your body. And there's a medical doctor, save or loss, that knows that. You have inside your body a body just like this one. You got a hand cut off like this, and about a year later you say, Mama, my fingers itch. And Mother says, Honey, you don't have any fingers, your hand's gone. Yeah, but they itch. You go to the doctor, and he says, Well, it's the nerve endings. <laughs> hey, son, the nerve endings, when you cut that hand off, they stop right there. They didn't go out there. But something goes out there. All right, you ready to quit? <laughs> Want to stop here and go on that, chewing that about 20 years? How do you, how do you, how do you observe the fact that all these people who profess to know something don't know anything even about what they are? Amen. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. Why? You're made in the image of God. All right, now here comes down on the cross, what happens? Comes down on the cross, Christ dying for your sins, and what is that? That is, God manifest in the flesh. I sure I'm glad he can't, came down and became a man for a while. Amen. Because if he, if, he, if he didn't, I couldn't have any fellowship with him. Right. Tell me something, what do you have in common with somebody who can make a universe? Right. What did you talk about, tea party or something when you sat down? You can't, why, you can't imagine it. In something in common with God, I've got nothing in common with God. Right. He's perfect, I'm not. He's sinless, I'm not. He made the universe, so I couldn't make a sand pile. <laughs> I mean, if I hadn't, he hadn't come down as a man, I never could know anything about him. Or you, or you, or you, or you, ones. But down he came, and then when he came down, he assumed the body, and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen God the Father. But you've never really seen God the Father. That's the inside, like that basketball. You can't see it. All right, Christ died on the cross for your sin, was buried the third day, he rose again the dead, according to the scripture. And there, what, is what you need to study in your Bible, and know what you need to know. And uh, I'm, on a, I'm just going to make a silhouette. I don't have time to put out the chalk people. So I'll just make a shadow here of a man like that. And I'll pretend the shadow of this fellow here is a picture of an unsaved man in the Old Testament. And I'll put a red one over here to show that he's an Old Testament saint who believed in the blood of the Lamb and offered the sacrifice down at the temple and was under the blood. When you talk about salvation over here, you never talk about it like it is over here. Amen. You know what Solomon says? He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's not the gospel. Right. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's works. That's Old Testament. So you have a combination of works and faith in the Old Testament. And there isn't a Baptist that believes that. The Baptists think you're all saved the same way in both Testaments. Now let me show you how stupid that is. A young man comes to Jesus and says, What good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What does he say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? No, so he says, You know the commandments. Now, see that stuff? That stuff just goes on and on and on. When Ruckman points it out, Oh, Ruckmanite, Ruckmanite, hair ticker, shut your mouth. Your problem is that book. Amen. That's your problem. James says, You see how a man is justified by works and not by faith only? Referring to what? Rahab back in the Old Testament, Abraham back in the Old Testament. See that stuff? All right, now you should know where you're going when you die, and if you don't, there's something wrong with what you're doing. 
Uh, there, there they are, but in the Old Testament, boy, it's flexible in the Old Testament. You take, uh, you take old Saul, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and then leaves him and don't come back. You take the Holy Spirit, he comes on to Samson and leaves him and then comes back. You take David, he gets down on his knees and says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You call that New Testament? Paul never told you to pray, don't take your spirit from me. You're sealed to the day of redemption, man. They're not the same. Something happened right there, boy. Something happened right there, and it fixed that thing up. Well, now here's the earth service like this. And down here somewhere is a place in the center of the earth, and the Bible calls this place in the, in the Hebrew, Sheol. And that's talking about a grave. But that's a Sheol is a grave for souls. And the poor old, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, no hellers, they're saying the grave is hell, and when you die, you go to the grave, and you're unconscious, and then you don't come up here the last thing, and then you get, you're, you're, that's the end of you. But the grave up here, the grave up here, these graves up here are by graves for bodies. This is a body grave up here. This is a soul grave down here. Down here you have in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Greek you have this, Hades, looks like that. When you take that and transliterate it, you get Hades. And that's a long, yeah, that's a long A in there, a hard, a Hades, like that. Now that's what you call transliteration. That's not translation. There's your Greek word. How do you translate it? That's not a translation. That's a transliteration. What does that mean? I mean, you take a foreign word and then put the English letters down that match the sound of the word. But you don't translate it. How do you translate that thing? Hot ace. Maybe you can make, maybe make an E to make it look better. Yes. Hot ace. Like that. All your new Bibles, when they hit the word hell, they change it to hot ace. They don't like to translate. That's a translation. That's a transliteration. In that one, you put up the English words that match the sounds. Ha, de, ace. That one you translate. Hell. The new Bibles don't like to talk about hell. So they just leave it out. When they get to heaven, they don't have any trouble. They get Uranus in the Greek for heaven, and, they, and for heaven, they'll say heaven, they'll translate it into English, but they won't translate that one. They have a, you have a complex about that for some reason. Guess why? <laughs> oh, I think you've got something down here in the heart of the earth. You take your Bible, get studying those things, you know what you read? You read, there was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus laid at the gate of the rich man's house, designed to be fed with the crumb that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dog came and slicked his sores. And it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried to Abraham's bosom. Where is that? Plenty up there. They don't go to heaven when they die in the Old Testament. Only one ever did. Enoch. That's the only one that went up. You say, if Moses went up, yeah, but he's going to lose his head again in the tribulation when he comes back. Only one man ever got to heaven in the Old Testament, and that's Enoch. You know why God has to have a one man like that that never dies? Christ died. Enoch came out better than Christ did. Enoch never died, and he never will die. You say, why? He's a type of a Christian who's living when Christ comes. It is the point of man wants to die, and after this, the judgment... That's a general statement. It's not a, uh, not a, a theological statement. A lot of them die twice. Well, come, did he raise Lazarus from the dead? Yes. What happened after that? Lazarus died. You take Simon Peter, raised that woman from the dead in the book of Acts. Later on, she dies. A lot of them die twice. You take uh, Moses, he dies, drops dead there. You can't find his grave. In the, when the Lord comes in the tribulation, before he comes, Moses comes back, gets his head cut off. Dies twice. So when you say it's appointed a man to die once, it's a general statement about men, but it's not theological. Some of them die twice. A guy can get his head cut off in the tribulation for a living for God and come back in the millennium and then die of old age in the millennium. You see what I mean, Jelly Bean? <laughs> I mean that, that book, that book, that book, you you that book you'd be surprised, boy. That book is a ripper, boy. And he told you to study to show yourself approved unto God of work in the day of night to be ashamed by to buy the word of truth. While these fellows, they die. He goes to Abraham's bosom. Where is it? Beats the fire of me. I don't know where it is. 
I mean, if you find something the Bible you don't understand, keep on reading you find something you do understand. That's all there is to that. Uh, I'm just let Abraham's bosom go. Now I'll get this. And the rich man also died, and in hell, lifted his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and said, Send Lazarus, that may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Where do you go? He went straight down. Where is hell? It's right under your feet. How do you know? Well, as, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When Christ died, he didn't go to heaven. He went down. You know why he went down? He went down to get somebody. You got a Bible there on your lap? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I mean, half the Baptists in America know anything about this thing at all. They don't read the Bibles. I don't know what they read, Pogo or what, what, what they read. Pick that thing up there in Ephesians chapter 4. And Brother uh, Peacock, if you would, would you read us real slow, being at about verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high... Well, stop, just to, I, want, I got to interrupt you. It's hard to say it again, that's what you read. When he ascended up on high... You know what ascended means? How many know? Got to see your hands? Well, it went up. Okay, go ahead. He led captivity captive. Okay. And gave gifts unto men. Somebody before he went up, he took some captives out of prison and took them with him. Where'd you ever read about that in the commentary? You never did. Go ahead. Now that he ascended, Growing what up. is it, but that he also descended first. Then he descended first down here, and then he ascended up here. And when he ascended up here, he took captives with him. Yep. Keep on reading. Into the lower parts of the earth. Ah, uh, lower parts of the earth. He didn't go up to heaven when he died. He went down there. Right. Go ahead. He that descended. He went down. Is the same also that ascended. Went up. Up far above all heaven. There you go. That he might fill all things. Now, you got that down? <laughs> you hear nothing about that. It's a jailbreak. <laughs> They're in captive, and he comes and turns the captives loose. What are they doing? They're down here. Well, who are they down there? Why, well, down here is obviously he's talking about old set, old, old Testament saved people. The saved people are down here, like Lazarus. And he saw Lazarus afar off, and said, "Send Lazarus. Let me dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame." And he said, Son, thou thy time receive good thy things, and Lazarus he will. Now he is comforted, now are tormented, and beside that there's a great gulf between us, so that they would come here, can't come to here, and those that are here can't come to there. Now that's what you're reading in the King James Bible. And that is the absolute truth, and the fact that 90% of the fellows don't recognize it is immaterial. Amen. Just put them all in the waste basket and forget them. Right. Uh, what, what this thing down here is called is called paradise. And the Jews call it Abraham's bosom. They call it Abraham's bosom because that's where, where, David, where Abraham went when he died. Paradise is like that in the Old Testament. And when a fellow dies, you know what it says? He was gathered to his forefathers. He was gathered to his four. It didn't say he went to heaven. He was gathered to his fathers. What's happening? The people are dying in the Old Testament can't get into heaven. What's the matter? Their sins aren't paid for. Back then, Deuteronomy, the Lord God forgiving, he forgave all kinds of things that will not take away sin. When Christ shows up, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. When he gets through, you get up. But till he gets through, you ain't going nowhere but right down there. Look at here, dying thief hanging on the cross. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today... Shalt thou be with me in where? Paradise. He didn't go to heaven, went to paradise. It's right there. Like that. That day Christ, this day you're going to be, that day Christ died. And the thief did after that, and they met down here. So what he did was come down through here, and go through here, and go through here, and then come up there. Work on that one a while. <laughs> if he went through here, he had to open the door to get in there, and if he had to go out of here, he had, to, he had a door to get out. So when he shows up in the book of Revelation, he says, I'm the son of man, I was dead and I'm alive and have the keys of death and hell. 
So he is the keeper of the keys. You know, those keys occur on the papal flag in Rome. Like he's got the keys to heaven and hell, the Pope's got them. No, he don't. You know, years ago when Martin Luther King was coming down here and the Catholics were coming around trying to get converts, they made the mistake of taking a little black boy there, been a Baptist deacon for about 40 years, and they said, what church are you belong? He said, I was a Baptist. And they said, well, you belong to the wrong church. You ought to belong to the church that has the keys. Jesus gave the keys to, to Simon Peter. He said, shucks, I don't need them keys. I got the dope. <laughs> Amen, brother. I don't know for fool cotton picking keys. I got the door, man. Amen. All right, now what did he do? He went down here and preached for the souls in prison. That's in the first Peter's. Then it says, For this cause was the gospel preached to them that are dead, they might be judged according. That's in first Peter. And nobody picks it up. He steps over here and says, You fellas waiting for the hot squad? <laughs> you know, gonna ride the gonna ride the lightning? <laughs> and they say, Yes, all right, it's gonna sudden such a date, see you around, off he goes. And he steps over here and says, you fellas have been waiting for a lamb to show up? Yes, sir. Amen. And they say, yes. He said, oh, I'm it. Let's go, boys. <laughs> and he empties the place. Amen. I tell the guy in the prison all the time, I say, if you're saved, man, don't have to worry about trying to get your way through the concertina bomb wire outside there. If you're saved, you're going straight through that scene without bumping your head. Amen. I don't forget one guy at the big, the big outfit in, in Florida. Uh, what's, what's the big one? Right. Well, the, well, yeah, yeah, Ray, Ray, we talked to that guy, and he was a saved fella, and he said, I sure want to thank you for bringing these chick tracks in here, because we ain't allowed to bring them in. You slip them in, and I get them to my patients up there in the AIDS ward. And we said, you work in the AIDS ward? He said, yes, sir. We said, isn't that kind of dangerous? And he said, you mean I might get home quicker? <laughs> <laughs> my people don't talk like that. <laughs> What a way to talk, man. Now, there's a Christian boy. You think I might get home quicker? That fellow knows you know where he knows his home. It's upstairs. He's ready to go there. How about you? Would you like a few more years down here, weeks down here, days down here? <laughs> Hello. God bless you, brother. <laughs> All right, now, here he comes down like this, this, and he goes through here like this, and he picks this bunch up here, and your sins are now paid for. On the cross, when he dies on the cross, he says, it is finished. Now, here's a piano. Suppose I made a piano like this thing right here, and I got an axe and hit it a couple of times, and I poured kerosene on it and gas set fire to it, kicked the slats out of the bottom, and I say, they say, what are you doing to my piano? I said, I'm putting the finishing touches on it. <laughs> and say, well, you fool, it was already finished before you got to it. Right. Well, Christ dies on the cross, and then along you come with your little wood horse. Little wood horse, you know, we play like a little boy, you know, with you come in your trough and get him baptized, and then take the sacraments, and then have a whole post row, and then a little, you know. Hey man, the work's done. It's, it's finished. You can't do nothing to it. Man's always trying to do something, do something, do something. A fellow said to me one time, he said, Ruckman, you ever doubt your salvation? Yeah, I doubt my salvation sometimes. 64 years of it. I mean, if, a, if, I, if, if you could lose your salvation, I'd have lost mine at least 64 times. <laughs> but I don't do it. You say, what do you do? Well, uh, well I, I doubt my salvation. You say, how long? Oh, maybe about something like five seconds or something like that. But you take what, what it is. It's like, it's like this here. I'm trying to find something here to lean on. Well, now you take a thing like this right here. Now, I'm leaning on this. I'm counting on this holding me up. Now, if you take this thing away, I'm going to fall. And truth is not relative. I'm going to fall that way. <laughs> what you might know, I not, might not take out away. I'm going down this way. Now, suppose I'm like this and right hell, hell below me, like right there. And what am I leaning on? I'm leaning on the finished work of Christ. Amen. And about the time I'm here, the devil comes along and said, uh, have you been slain in the spirit? I said, I don't know about that, but I'm trusting Christ to save me. And said, do you talk in tongues? No, I don't have time to. Well, you're going to hell. You've lost your salvation. Well, if I'm going to hell, I'll see you when you get there. So I'll see you around, buddy. I mean, the devil's going to hell, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, I'll see you when you get there. The devil says, well, how are you sure? I'm not sure of anything. I'm sure of one thing. I'm staying right here and trusting what Christ did to form. I ain't going nowhere to pick up nothing. Amen. Now, you're counting on something keeping you out of hell, aren't you? Well, you don't want to go to hell, do you? Well, what do you count on keeping you out? 
Well, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ. I'm not about to pull out the way to get anybody any, any problem. I'm enjoying it right the way it is. Run on, I'll see you there. The devil said, you're going to hell. I'll say, see you when I get there. In the meantime, let me alone. have a good time. Yeah. I'm resting on the finished work of Christ. Amen. It's done. He said it is finished. Amen. All right, now that's the, the, the salvation. That's salvation, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this fellow, when he goes down, he goes down here. He's lost. Now, step this side here. Christ died for your sin. Don't let this red silhouette represent a fellow who is trusting the blood of Christ to save him. He's up here. And he's under the blood. What can wash away my sin? You've been singing about it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But not the silhouette, black silhouette here, represent an unsaved man that's not trusting the blood. He's trusting something else. Anything else. My hope is built on Jesus Christ and nothing else. So they die, and what happens to them? Or take the unsafe, unsafe fellow who dies, what happens to him? Well, he can't go to heaven. He isn't saved. He can't go to pur uh, paradise down Abraham's bosom. It's empty. He can't go to purgatory, because there ain't no purgatory. <laughs> Where does he go? I teach he goes to hell. I say the fellow goes to hell. I believe that. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here preaching. I wouldn't come down to these prisons and take all this time down here. These fellas, if I didn't think they were a little horn lost, I believe they go to hell. Back then, World War II, and they get ready to take an island, the LCTs and things, and before they bail out to get shot, a lot of times they had an unsaved uh, 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 chaplain there who was raised in a modernist church and a modernist school and was an evolutionist and God knows what. One of those smooth, sick, liberal guys got up there on the front deck before they made a landing and said, well, you fellas want a sermon or a good story? <laughs> and one fellow said, well, if that's the way you feel about it, tell us a story. And one old hillbilly from Arkansas said, before you go to talk to us, let me ask you something, preacher. Does you believe there's a hell or don't you? <laughs> and that, you know, liberal, you know, IQ, about 180, he said, of course I don't. God's not a torture master. And that old hillbilly said, we don't want to hear you preach then. Yeah. And the liberal said, why not? He said, well, if you're there's a hell, you're lying. We don't want to hear no liar preach. Amen. And if there ain't no hell, what would you need us to listen to you preach for? <laughs> Good question. What did what, what, what God, God call Brother Peacock to do? What did he call me to do? He called us to talk. A fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. So Paul said, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them and believe. He called us to talk. And he called us to talk, and we were to talk like men were dead and, and dying, and when they are, they went to hell. And if they don't go to hell, what, 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 why should I talk to you about what? The father said, well, you're, you're preachers, you tell us what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad. Cut it out, will you? Cut it out, you're breaking my heart. I mean, you got anybody, nobody in this building, 15 years old, doesn't know that if you want to find out if a thing was right or wrong, all you had to do was go home and kneel by your bed and close your eyes and ask the Lord to tell you and show you, and you'd know before you got up. Amen. Well, God, what preachers are for? What are preachers for? We're here to make the comfortable miserable and the miserable comfortable. <laughs> My job is just to keep you torn and upset to where you can't be at home in this world anymore and you want to get home. That's, that's it. My little girl said to me one time, she said, Daddy, is your mother still alive? I said, no, honey, she's dead. She said, was she saved? And I said, no, she, she wasn't saved. We're out in the garden talking, you know, she's about 11 years old. She said, well, she is, is she in hell right now? And I said, yeah, if she died without a cry, she's in hell. And she said, well, is she screaming right now? Now, some of you Southerners don't understand what I'm saying. You'd put your family ahead of God every time. Amen. I'm not that way. When that book says one thing and my mother says something else, my mother's wrong. When that book says one thing and my wife says something else, my wife is wrong. When that book says one thing and I say something different, I'm wrong. And I said, yeah, I guess she's still screaming. You shouldn't have told her that. What do you want to have me do, lie to her? See that stuff? Listen, do you think those of us think people are going to hell, do you think we get some kind of sadistic thrill out of telling you that? I don't get any. About talking about people burning. If I saw a cat running along and he's on fire and I had a bucket of water, I'd throw it on him and 
cool him off. Oh, but I hate cats. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to see, see him burn to death. I bet you can't find anybody find anybody you hate. Of course, some you hate pretty good. But I bet you haven't got anybody that you hate enough so you'd like to see him burn forever. Come on now, forever? No, sir. No, sir. Maybe a couple of hundred years, you know. You <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. I preached that one time in jail and said that. But you want to see him uh, 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 suffer forever and ever. And I heard a big bass voice in the back say, yes, I would. <laughs> what he mean, fella. But he never tried living with a fella burning that long. I wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to see anybody burn that long. Well, if they go, they, they, they go, they, they go to hell. If I didn't believe that, I'd quit preaching. Amen. I was preaching with the no heller a place at one time when I was preaching. I was talking to the no heller witness to him between services. He's a farmer down there in South Alabama, and we get talking about this and that. And he gave me ten verses to prove there wasn't any hell, and I gave him twenty to prove there was. And after I got through talking with him, and I got nowhere, I finally said. Uh, uh, to him, you know, I, you know, I said, I said, uh, you, what you've got may be all right for you, but not, not for somebody else. We need to know where we're going when we die. And I said, you don't know where you're going when you die, so what is good of what you've got to, to speak? Now listen, if, you know what I could do, and I, I do, if I was real mean, I could do this. If you could call me in for a week meeting, Monday night I could prove to you conclusively there isn't any hell for the Scripture. I know what the Scriptures are. I could turn you right to them. And then Tuesday I could prove there is a hell. You can prove anything with that book. If you mess it up enough, if you add to it or take from it or take it out of the context, you can prove anything. Then Tuesday night I'd get up and prove you can't lose your salvation. Wednesday night I'd prove you could. And then Thursday I'd get up and say you ought to go to church on Friday and Saturday like a seven-day Adventist and then prove you ought to go on a Sunday. And then the last night I was there I'd say, well, have a good day and <laughs> go out the door. <laughs> And just leave them all tore up. I would say, Ruckman's a heretic, a heretic. A her I'm the funniest heretic you ever saw. But I know two of the Bible. If, you, if I wanted to be a heretic, boy, you talk about one, I'd be a beauty. Because I know where the verses are. First thing I do is put a sign out in front of the church saying, the church that Jesus Christ founded. The church, the only one in town. How? Scripture. Thou art Peter. <laughs> well, that's what they do. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my I'm it right. Listen, if I want it, I, I know what the scriptures are. Say, you come here next Sunday, you all have a sex orgy right here Sunday morning. I know exactly where they are. Come to Bethel, that's the house of God, and transgress. That the Lord commanding you to come to his house, Bethel, Bethel, and then live like the devil. I want to rob a bank? Nothing to it. The robbers are secure, and that God brings into their hand abundantly. That's in Job. You can prove anything with that thing. If you just take it out of the context, or add to it or take from it, or what kind of business. I think when a fellow dies, an unsaved dies, he goes to hell and he burns. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be talking to you like I talk. Now, if you are saved, there's one thing, the one thing all saved people know. All, oh, no, how do they differ in their theologies and what they do? There's one thing they all know. If you're saved, you know that you are saved from hell. Amen. I don't know how you got messed up with your teaching after that, but if you're saved, you know what you're saved from. And you're saved from hell. And it's your job to warn people about that thing. Or oh, the fellow, when the fellow dies, he goes to hell. And I, I believe that. I believe that. And then when the fellow dies, is saved. Why? What does he do? He's absent from the body and present with the Lord. Paul says to depart and be with Christ is far better. Anytime you put somebody there on the ground who's saved, their spirit, their soul has left them a long time ago. That inner body has left and gone up before the undertaker ever gets it. And they're in better shape than you are right now. Paul said, I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is what? Far what? Far better. Say it again. All right, the ones that went ahead of us, they're better, they're better, they're far ahead of where you are right now. Paul was kind of a maniac depressive. <laughs> I mean, he'd say, I, I, I want to, I, if I have a trick too, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. He's thinking about taking his life. Now, of course, he didn't, but he said, if I had my choice, I'd say, let's go. Of course, he had an advantage over us. He knew where he was going because God let him see it. 
I always I kind of held that against him. You know. <laughs> All right, now what, what have we got here? We got a fellow who's unsaved when he dies, he goes to hell. There's a saved fellow, what's he doing? He's trusting Christ to save him. What has Christ has done? He's paid for all the sins ever committed on this earth. He has become sin for us who knew no sin. He has become sin because cursed is he hanging on a tree. He took my place and the devil's place. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. He's taken the devil's place. Ladies and gentlemen, he hasn't just borne your sins or paid for your sins. He became sin for us. That's why he's taking time in that garden. If it be thy will, let this cup pass for me. He wasn't trying to get away from the cross. He faced the cross joyfully, but not what happened on the cross. He knew if to save you, he had to turn into sin personified to pay for your sins. And that's why he's asking the Father for a way out. And the Father said, that's up to you. And he said, all right, then thy will be done. Do you ever stop thinking what would happen if he hadn't finished that thing? Nobody would ever get to heaven. They'd be down here. I sure am glad he took that cup. <laughs> I don't have to go down there. I go up there. And there's all kinds of ways you can go, good and bad ways. And The ideal way to die is to go to sleep at night and not wake up in the morning. And I, if, if, there's terrible ways to die, and I've seen Christians go through them and wondered about it. But uh, some, of, some of them, I recall a couple of my church, they've been married 60 years. 60 years. That isn't a golden winter anniversary, that's a platinum or a platunio, I don't know what kind of, what you call that. 60 years, man, that's a long time. You ought to give that guy a, 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 a medal for <laughs> staying married that long. <laughs> Loving the Lord, believing things, good Christian wife. And one, one day after church, Sunday morning, she was, him, children long gone, grandchildren gone, house by themselves. He was laying on the couch and she was about to do some dishes in the back for a few minutes. And she heard him laughing. He was about, I think he was about 85. And they'd been married 60 years. And she came in the room, and he's lying on the, bed, on the sofa in the living room laughing. And she said, what are you laughing at? He said, I don't know. I just feel so good. He said, I just, I just I felt like this before in my life. She said, well, keep it kind of quiet. <laughs> went back in, and he laughed. She heard him laugh a little while longer, and then it was quiet. And 10 minutes later, she went in there, and he was dead, gone. Now, boy, that's the way to go. And that way, the doctors don't get a cotton-picking dollar. <laughs> And the hospitals don't pick up 25 cents. That's the way to go like that, boy. If you go like that, that's a good way to go. Oh, boy, my church was, he was, his daddy was dying, an old-time Methodist preacher. And every now and then he'd kind of recover and then get sick and recover. One day he told his boy, he said, I, I'm going to go home today, son. And the boy said, well, daddy, you always been saying that. I'll call the doctor. He said, no use calling him. I'm going today. That's this time for sure. The doctor came over and gave him a shot, got out there in the backyard under the mimosa tree and drink an iced tea and just shoot the bull. And about that time, that old retired preacher looked up in the air and looked across the garden and said, wow, look at that. Man, oh man, that's the prettiest room I ever did see in my life. And then he turned to his son and the doctor and said, what made me say that? And the boy, his son said, I don't know, daddy. And he said, well, he said, Bye-bye. <laughs> well, he's gone. Two seconds right there. Well, bye-bye. Bam, out he goes. Boy, blessed is the person who can die like that. Uh, if I had to go for the Lord came, I always want to be shot. That's why. I, with, with a guy who knows how to aim, you know. I mean, I, I, I want the bullet to go two inches below the helmet liner, you know, right in the middle where I get home quick. And if, when I die, I intend to do a very nasty, nasty thing, which probably won't let me get away with, but... I would give them what they call the Prussian salute. <laughs> and you probably don't know what the Prussian salute is anymore, and I certainly ain't going to tell you here. <laughs> but it's not exactly clean, you know. <laughs> you know what I'd be doing? I'd be saluting the world, and the world was saying, you know, to hell with you, and I'm saying back to hell with you. I don't know why the world anything. I preach in the street in my hometown. Amen. I've done it for 60 years. Yes, back end of a pickup truck. Roman slaves, Jesus saves. You know, 
Life is short, death is sure, sin the curse, Christ the cure. You better be hell scared than hell scorched. <laughs> and my my brethren, I'm the TV repair man, and they all they know they had to put up with me down down there for from something like sixty years on the back end of that thing yelling. I'm, I, they say, oh, "Don't you worry about offending people?" No, I'm not. That, I, they offended me. I owe them nothing. I don't owe this world anything. All they did was teach me how to do a bunch of dirty stuff and put my soul in hell. I don't owe them anything. Amen. You young people, the young fellows try to, to smoke and drink and cuss and all that kind of stuff. You don't owe them nothing. Amen. What you owe to somebody is somebody that prayed for you and gave you a tract and tried to get to get you saved. And I don't owe the world a living. They owe me a living there behind five payments. <laughs> All right, now there goes the safe fellow, he dies. There's the unsafe fellow, he goes, and he goes to hell when he goes. All right, now is that all there is to it? No, that's not all there is to it. I don't have time to draw you the rest of it. You've got Christ coming back in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive shall be caught up together with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall be ever with the Lord. Judgment seat of Christ, then you come back and you reign on the earth with Christ for a thousand years. That's the thousand-year reign of Christ on this, so I don't have time to go into all this. And when that's over, then she ends. And those passages are the second Peter chapter three. A new heavens and new earth. Second Peter chapter three. And I the other night I gave you a whole thing on the Bible, on the whole Bible. I took you right down to that place where there's a new heavens and a new earth. And there's Second Peter chapter three in that last chapter. And at that time you run into this scene here. And this scene here is found, you got, if you've got a Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 20. And Brother uh, Peacock, if you would, begin, begin to read for us out of verse 11, slow and loud. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There was no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged every man according to their works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you see that thing? That thing ends in a lake of fire. And you know what people say without knowing what they're saying? They say, go jump in the lake. Now, they never say, go jump in a pond or jump in a river or jump in an ocean. They say, go jump in the lake, because that's what's going to happen. At that thing, the Lord says, a curse be ye. Uh, he said, depart from me. And he said, depart in everlasting darkness and everlasting fire. You go over to a lake of fire. And when Christ comes back at the, at the end of the tribulation, he comes in and he says, Cursed be ye, so cursed ye be those who don't accept him. And he says, you're going to be depart to everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's prepared for the devil and his angels. And where he read it, it said, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Did you see that in that passage? That means when you die, you go there, but you don't stay there. That's temporary. Because when that thing takes place, you're, ca you're called out, and there you get your second chance. Your people say, I think God will give me a second chance to be saved. Sure he will, right there, if you call out a chance. You're going to come down here, and you're going to come up there, and you're going to have the last time you're going to ever see the Lord, and prove to him that you ought to get into heaven. You're going to have to come up there and show why he did the unfair thing in sending you to hell, and you ought to get into heaven. Now, if you want to call out a chance, okay, that would no chance for me. Uh, I wouldn't last a minute. If I had to last before God and give a reason why He should put me into heaven, I wouldn't say one word about loving my wife, which I do, and being true to her, which I am, and giving a half my income to, for tithe, which I do. I wouldn't mention any of that stuff. If I had to hit the Lord tonight, I'd be flat in my face, boy, and I wouldn't open my mouth until I was spoken to. Amen. That's the difference. Why, you think Muhammad would scare me? Muhammad is going to judge me? Come in, I say, sit over there, you bum. i got more to do to take care of you. 
If Buddha came over, I'd say, you lazy bum, you went off and left your wife for 30 years and sat under a bow tree, never did a work, a lick of work in your life, beat it, we got wisdom here. Right. And if Christ came in here right now, I'd be flat in that floor of my face, boy. I wouldn't say meow, man. You say, well, I know who I am. You know who you are? Yes, sir. Well, you want to find out, you're going to find out here in the day that God shall judge the secrets of men according to my gospel. Paul says, I'll tell you what the whole, well, Solomon says, I'll tell you what the trouble is. The trouble is, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring thee in judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Someday you're going to be out here and you're going to be judged for everything you did. Did what you did in the back seat of the car, everybody in the universe will know all about it. God will take out a movie of what you've done and thought and said since you were five years old and show it if you want to see it. If you want to prove what a fine fellow you are, I, why, if I took your life right now and showed a full color um, with sound, everything you thought since you were five years old, would it be pretty to look at? Why, some of us would get sick and be puking and couldn't look at it. And that's what's going to happen there. God's going to call them up. And they're going to, a, a multitude, up they come. And up they come and they stand there before the Lord and they give an account. The, what, 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 why they think they ought to get to heaven. And there's some people there that come out of this place, come out of the, the uh, reign of Christ, they'll be there, but their names will be in the book of life. Some of them come out of the tribulation, their names will be in the book of life. So there are saved people there, but none from this age. The one from this age went out here when Christ came and called you out of the rapture, and you're not going to be there down here, you're going to be up here. You got a Bible? Turn to 1 Corinthians. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. No preacher preaches this. It's just the King James Bible if you're going to find this stuff here. When, Christ, when the Lord shows up to judge these people, the thousand thousands before him and thousands times ten thousand with him doing the judging. Look at get 1 Corinthians, and I'm not too sure about this reference. Brother Peacock, if you'd find me one there. That's right after they, they take that fellow and kick him out of church and deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And then coming down the next chapter, which would probably be somewhere around four or five, it's uh, coming down there and saying, what, know you not, you shall judge angels? Six. Where is chapter that? Six. Okay, read that for us, would you? Do you not know what saints shall judge, that saints shall judge the world? Stop, the stop. World? Now, I have to stop, but you've got to get this. Read that, just what you read then and stop. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? You didn't know that. You didn't know that when you came in here, did you? That someday you'd judge the world? How come you didn't? Do you, what do you read, the funny paper? That's the Christian. They don't read that book. Every Christian ought to know what he just read. Amen. You're going to judge the world. Amen. Now they're judging you right now. If you're living for the Lord, they call you a fanatic. And if you don't live for the Lord, they call you a hypocrite. Right, well, someday you're going to judge them. You say, why? Scripture. Yes, but nobody quotes the Scripture. The preachers don't quote it. Now, read some more where you're reading. And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge in smallest, the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Whoa, look at that. How about that one? You not only judge the, the people, you judge rebellious angels. Oh, you're somebody, aren't you? Go ahead. How much more things that pertain to this life? All right, now that's what's going to happen to you. When Christ does it, has his last th throne judgment, he's going to judge. God hath ordained it, and he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained and give assurance everywhere, and he raised him from the dead. The judge is going to be Jesus Christ, but he got a bunch with him. You got a jury. Who's that? That's you. Amen. That's you. You know where I'm quoting? Of course not. I'm quoting from Daniel, where he said, Thousand, thousand stood before him, and ten thousand times, times, times ministered to him. That's you. You've been just like Christ for a thousand years. And so you take part in the judgment, and you judge with him. Now, do you think I'm going to enjoy seeing my mother come up there? My daddy? You don't read your Bible and all tears are wiped away until uh, chapter 21. Right, right. After the white throne judgment. 
So obviously mama come out of where she's been down there for, she's got to be down there a thousand years. That's the millennium. And up she comes, rags of a self-righteousness, depart me, curse an everlasting fire. You think I'm going to rejoice about that? That's why that Bible says, about God will wipe away all tears from my eyes. That occurs two times in Revelation. You know where they are? One of them is after the judgment seat of Christ. And one of them is after the white throne judgment. You say, well, I wouldn't weep. I'm like Christ. Christ wept over Jerusalem. Went to Lazarus' temple where Lazarus was buried. And he said, behold, how he loved him. And Jesus wept. So the tears... No teardrops in heaven. There are plenty of teardrops in heaven until here, till this is over. And up they come and down they go. Now I'm going to pretend for a minute, and I hope I'm pretending wrong, but I'm, I'm going to pretend for a minute that you wind up in hell. And I hope you don't. But if you do, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be in there, and you're going to be in there weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and God knows what. And then after years, a year, years and years, you're going to come out and when you come out, you're going to come up here. And when you come up here, there's nothing to stand upon. You just read where he just read you had said before, whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead. See, there's no earth there. Technically, they are not resurrected. The earth and, and it just goes bam like that. And there you are standing there like you were in the grave. And you'd be standing like this, and you look down like this. And there's about uh, 20 million light years below you of darkness. And there's nothing under your feet. And you'll stand there and face that light and turn away from that light, light no man can see or look under sea. And you look down there like this and you say, my God, what's holding me up? And the first thing that will strike you is God's holding me up. Because there ain't nothing to hold you. You're standing out there in the air. You're not dropping. What's keeping you there? The Lord's keeping you there. Now, I'm, I don't have to learn that. I got that down. I'm standing here right now. Why am I standing here? Because the Lord holds me up. Oh, your legs hold you up. They ain't worth a dime. They could collapse right now. You get a good gut block, block and over you like that. I know why I'm standing here. It's because of the floor. The Lord can get this earthquake and knock away the floor and drop you down there 300 feet. I'm standing here because God lets me stand here. And it'll finally get to you. But, boy, too late. You stand there like you look up like this, and there's that light again. You can't look at it. If they're running your record, you won't be able to look at it. Probably you'll be saying, "Turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off." I, I, I surrender. You are. You're right. I'm wrong. And then he'll say, "All right, before you go down on your knees, and down you'll go on your knees, and out in thin air, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend, every head shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord of the glory of God the Father." Down you'll go and confess Jesus is Lord. And the Lord will say, out, out, and out you'll go. And you pitch off in the darkness and you'll be falling down there 20 million miles a second in the dark, hollering, amen. Saying what? Saying amen to your own damnation. You know you earned it. Oh, my God, what a way to live and die. JFK, front and center. Down you go, boy, speak, sit down, roll over. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Genghis Khan over here, Napoleon over here, Marilyn Monroe, step this way, Princess Di over this way, down to your knees, sister. You know, some of us dumb preachers that are just uh, preach like I preach, like your pastor preach, you know how many times we fail to win people to Christ? Did you know something? There's going to come a day when we're going to come out on top and we're going to live to see the conversion of every person we've ever preached to. I'm going to live to see the day where everybody I've preached to, man, woman, child, black, white, orange, uh, green, uh, partel, uh, every, every nation, everybody I've ever preached to, converted to my, my religion. My religion is trust in Jesus Christ. And someday I'm going to see every one of them bow down and say, Jesus is Lord. And no man confesses Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. We're going to about a thousand before we get through. Maybe we'll about a thousand tonight. Maybe you're unsaved, you come through here at night, and while the weather this thing go out, don't get saved for 10 more years, I don't get saved at all. But I'll tell you one place where I'll see you converted. I'll see you come forward with me sitting right up here watching you. And he'll say, down, boy, and you'll go down. Last one over, the devil. Lucifer, front and center. Over he comes, down, boy. 
confess, you remember that time back there when you offered me all the kingdoms of this world if I'd just bow down and worship you one time? And the devil said, yes, sir. Well, I'm taking all the kingdoms. You're going to bow down. You bow. And he'll bow his head and say, Jesus is Lord. And out. And out he goes. Now, for God's sake and for your own sake, for your family's sake, don't let that happen to you. If I die right now, this minute of standing here, I'll hit that thing right there and kick around, you know, and bite my tongue and stuff, and I roll around in my head, you know, and somebody say, get an ambulance, call somebody, woo woo woo, get, get back, get some water and all that stuff. I'll just step out of my corpse. My, my soul will step out of the corpse and stand there and say, cool it, man, I'm okay, I'm okay. Cool it, man, I'm okay. You won't hear a word I'm saying. <laughs> and about that time, two young men will show up about 33 years old, and none of them will have wings, and they're not from an insurance company. (laughs) And they'll get up, they'll show up, and they'll say, you ready to go? And say, am I ready to go, man? I've been ready to go for 64 cotton-picking years. Let's go, (laughs) and I will go. And if that's you up a go, you'll begin to feel the presence of God like you never felt it before in all your life. Then you'll hit a thing over there, the lights are bright on, put your eyes out. And the next thing you know, you'll feel a peace and a, 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 a love and a welcome like you never faced down here at all. And there you're going to wait absent of the body, present of the Lord, till the Lord comes. And then you're going to come back down here and get your brand new body just like Jesus Christ. Which means you'll be able to become visible and visible at will and move fast with the speed of light and eat and eat like I told you the other night and never get fat. <laughs> Would that be wonderful? Yes. All right. Uh, you had enough now for one night? <laughs> a bunch of fanatics. <laughs> how, many you ever, how many of you ever been called a Ruckmanite? Let me see your hands. Now, you know how silly that thing is right now? It, well, somebody said one of our boys preaching down the street. He was a Ph.D. from Bob Jones. And we pulled one of our street preachers and said, You're a Ruckmanite. And he said, What's a Ruckmanite? That's a good question. What is a Ruckmanite? Or somebody believes everything Ruckman believes. My own kids don't believe everything I believe. <laughs> and he told this fellow, he said, to Ruckman, uh, do you believe the King James Bible was perfect? And the kid said, yeah. So you don't believe it has any errors in it? He said, no. And he said, Ruckman taught you that. You're following a man. And I happened to have a sharp kid on the, on the street that day, and he said, uh, well, do you believe it does have errors? And he said, of course. And he said, what man were you following? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Please. Boys and girls, it ain't Ruckman. It's that cotton-picking book. That's the problem. They can't stand it's the book. All right, let's stand for prayer. Let's stand for prayer. And if your musician would come and play something for us, and I, I suppose that in a congregation like this, you're all saved. Might be, I don't know. How many of you are, how many of you are saved and know it? Would you raise your hands? Pull them up a minute or a while. Let me just look around. I can't see much, really, but most of it looks like just about everybody. But if there's somebody that's not, not saved, you better take a long look at that. God's going to give you two chances. He'll give you a chance after you've been in hell. But you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to make it. You should have taken your chances right there. Lightning never strikes twice in the same place. And when lightning comes down, it comes down on a helpless lamb and bombs for me, he takes what I should if I was bombed by the Lord, it's taken care of right there. It don't strike in the same place. When your forefathers crossed the western part of this country and went through Montana and Idaho and Colorado and those Conestoga wagons, those covered wagons, they had Indians come after them, they had prairie fires come after them, and sometimes those prairie fires would be through six foot grass with a 29 hour wind, and you couldn't possibly outrun them. So the old fellow would get out of the lead uh, wagon and strike tender and light and let it burn out ahead of them. And they watch it burn out ahead of them. And as it burned out ahead of them, they take the caravan and move it into the place it was burned. And when the fire caught up to where he began the fire, it couldn't burn him. It was already burned. And when the fire from God catches up, it isn't going to get me because it's already burned. It's burned right there. My sin got burned up right there. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a man in hell who's paying for sin. And that's the one that died in my place and paid for me.
God's not going to hit it twice. He hit Christ for me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, bless your people here tonight. And keep them in your word. and Give them the love for your word and the thirst for your word. And they'll not be caught short when they hit the judgment seat of Christ and find they haven't spent the time as they should. I pray you might speak with them about it. Most of all, I pray you might speak with them about their neighbor or the people around them or the people they work with and have them see the real condition of these people. And Lord, give them the courage to speak up and do something about it, I pray. Now let's remain in prayer, heads bowed and eyes closed. And in a minute, we're going to close up the service. But before we close up the service, I want to impress upon you, once again, your responsibility. You know what happens to unsaved people. And you can't stand before God and pretend you didn't know. You know. What have you never done about it? Pray a little while, think. Have you had a stringer? Christ said, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. You got a stringer? Where is it? You profess to follow Christ? That must be false profession. He said, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Well, if you're following him, you're catching some men for the Lord. Are you catching anybody for the Lord? He said, if you're following me, you're doing it. God help you. God help you. Brother Peacock, come ahead. Let's remain in prayer for just a minute. Your heads are bowed. Think for just a minute about what the preacher told you. You know a lot. You know more than most preachers know. The question is, is will you take what you know and do something with it or just let it rot inside your brain? Probably, if not the best, one of the best meetings we've ever had. You ever just stop for just a minute to pause and say, Lord, thank you for keeping that old preacher around for another year. Thank you for letting our church be involved in 208 grown men and women trusting you as their personal Savior. Thank you for a place where we can come and a board for him to draw on and him being able to stir us up again. Maybe just pause for a minute and think about it. God's been good to us. Not to end on a low note, but to him who much is given. Much is required. Let's do something with it. Let's do something with it.